and welcome to another episode of Immigration and Mobility Decoded. I am your host, Eric, and today we are talking all things UK immigration. And to help me do so is Antonio Lamb, the Director of UK Immigration at Envoy Global. Antonio, thank you so much for hopping on the show today. Thank you for having me. Very excited to have you. I know we have been uh, chatting uh, quite a few a bit in these last few months to get you on. So finally excited to to get you on the show to talk UK immigration. Uh, I, I have to say off the bat, I am like a low key fan of like the UK immigration system and just the government um, and political setup of, of, of the UK. So uh, kind of kind of nerded out a little bit when, when doing some research on this. Yeah, I mean, I went to politics today. Uh, it's very messy as with, I think, the rest of the world. Right. So, um, yeah, the little we talked about the better, I think. Uh, but immigration, certainly there's a whole lot of stuff that's happening, which is which is quite exciting to some, not so exciting to others, but certainly changes are in place yeah yeah uh, i'm not sure if you're watching there's a show um called traitors i think it originated in in the uk it's like a game show mm. um and they released a u.s version on one of our streaming services uh peacock i'm not sure if that's available where you're at um but one of the uh participants or contestants is uh the former um speaker of the house uh john burklaw oh, wow. um uh, and it's just a little hilarious because like up until this point, it was just I would see him in the news clips and he had that like very unique voice. And then to see him <laughs> mingling with like reality TV stars is kind of like, like, whoa. Oh, <laughs> wow. That's here? amazing. I didn't know that. Yeah, we, we do have the show here. I, I don't watch it, but uh, I've been told that it's, 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 you know, raving reviews about it. Highly, highly recommend if you're looking for a good for like a good fun game show that's like, you know, kind of. I don't know. It has a unique element, a unique spin to it. So it's pretty fun. Um, but yeah, Antonio, you know, obviously we're going to talk UK uh, immigration, but, you know, before we dive into some uh, some of the meat of the conversation, just wanted to uh, turn it over to you to, just to talk a little bit more about your, your experience um, and kind of your background and all that good stuff. Yeah, I mean, immigration probably is my life, whether I like it or not. I've, um, I've, well, I'm an immigrant myself. I, 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 I was born in Macau. And, um, and since a young age, I've been moving around uh, to Canada, Portugal, um, to UK, of course, UK is actually my, well, I, I like to say final destination, but I'm sure it's not. Um, so I've, I've been, I've been in the UK for about 20, 20 plus, no, more than that, actually, um, 24 years now, I think counting. Um, so, so yeah, been a long time, but yeah, so moved a lot. Um, fortunately, not too many visa issues, uh, along the way as I was quite young moving around, but certainly understand the, the nature of a lot of private and corporate immigration. So that's sort of, I guess, where my immigration uh, experience started. But um, I've been in the field um, just, well, as a, as a, as a well, graduated as a, as a, a lawyer, um, just under just under 20 years, really. And um, I got a, sort of shoved into immigration, uh, almost. Um, I, I, my, my, my thoughts has always been, hey, let, let's, let's be something else let's be some you know some exciting law but little did i know actually mm -hmm. immigration has been very cap captivating so to speak uh took over yeah. almost 20 years of my life and um <laughs> <laughs> so here we are we're still doing immigration when when you say you almost when you got shoved into it what do you what do you mean well it's it, uh, it, it was it was my inspiration um actually just doing something else like you know criminal law or corporate law or um you know anything right because uh, immigration was never sort of the the highlight of of a, of a of a lawyer's sort of chat when you're around right or well, at least during my time anyway uh but you know and, and a chance encounter um with uh with my sort of first um uh, first job you know they were mentioning oh you know you're doing employment law and everything else and uh we tried to dabble into immigration because you know a lot of people are having issues with it and uh, and i was like well it must be easy it must be form filling right uh well it's not it's very complex <laughs> and so i got really interested into it and so i got trained up onto it i practice it uh so sort of almost got shoved because it was almost like well there's a side job that needs to be done do you want to do it right and i was like yeah all right i'll, I'll have a go with it uh and that's how it all started and um never looked back since and it's it's one of the best things i think i, I think i think i think i've made my right choice yeah it, it, it's kind of funny how in, in life 
it, it when when we look back at things obviously life never works out as we intended no. <laughs> uh as as the motto goes but then you, you we when you look back at, and especially in this instance you're like you know what i made the right choice yeah <laughs> well, I hope so anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah, Antonio, you know, I think to kind of start, uh, you know, when discussing UK immigration, mm-hmm. obviously, the UK has, a, you know, a unique immigration system, as does every other country. Uh, can you just give us an overview of the current UK immigration, you know, generally, you know, how does it operate and what are some key things to know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, I mean, the, the majority of, of, of people that we deal with, um, especially Envoy anyway, they are, um, they are mostly sort of, um, employees wanting to move to the UK, um, or globally for that matter, right. Or, or businesses need to transfer, you know, uh, workers from one country to another, and UK tends to be a fairly uh, popular sort of uh, destination, um, to say the very least. Um, but uh, I mean, in terms of uh, in terms of usual immigration route, it, it's fairly similar to the rest of the world, right? We've got you know your sort of personal immigration routes, and then you've got your sort of work routes. But for the work routes, it it, it sounds very complicated, but it it but it it can be very complicated. But most of the time, you know, we're really looking at whether it's sponsored work or not sponsored work. That's sort of how the system sort of work in terms of basic working corporate uh, business immigration. Uh, for majority of, 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 of employers that are hiring overseas workers, they would have a license um, under various routes. So we've got the skilled worker route, for example, or the global business mobility route. Um, and the workers will hold, you know, a, a visa uh, based on those categories effectively um, to allow to work in the UK. It really depends, obviously, of, of, the, of, the, of the need of the of the individual but um but you know you can have temporary transfers which which um, which which can be up to five or nine years effectively um uh, and and of course it can be permanent move uh, as well um but the uk i think one one of the uh, one of the i think interesting things about the uk um is they don't just offer one route or you know you have one work route or two work routes right they have a stream of different work routes right so we've i mean i, I touched on having you know skilled worker or global business mobility i mean just global business mobility itself has several sort of streams of different things that we look at right and some are very temporary like 12 months or 24 months you know um to you know non-sponsored route we're talking about you know scale up workers you know um uh, a scale up visa rather and you have your you know and they celebrate you know uh, talent and so they have a special global talent route so there's a plethora of, of, of routes and that i guess that's what makes uk uh, immigration uh, system quite sort of exciting um, I know there are a lot of headlines. Again, we're not going to talk politics today, but obviously there are a lot of headlines <laughs> about you know the number of people coming in. But uh, and I think yeah. it's the choice of immigration programs and and the availability of work that that allows and obviously generate the interest. Right, there, if there's a supply, there has to be demand. Right. 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 Does the does the set of, does the UK immigration system are they do they operate on some other. Uh, uh, visas or pathways um like on a lottery system the reason i'm asking is over here in the states mm-hmm. you know we have our big h1b course, cap yeah. lottery coming up at the start of march and that one there's a, a finite number eighty five thousand visas yeah uh does the uk operate similarly do they have any uh work visa options that are you know somewhat similar to the h1b in terms of like hey there's only an annual number and yeah. then you got to enter into a lottery. Et yeah. So, so at one point, the bygone sort of era, right? They, 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 there was a time where uh, what we now know as a skilled worker route, uh, tier two, effectively, uh, back in the day, or tier two general, as it used to be called, there used to be a cap on the number of work permits, effectively, you know, per month and so on and so forth. Um, I can't recall it so many years ago now, but I can't recall sort of the exact numbers of it. I, I think it's like 12,000 or 30,000, something along those lines. But at the time, immigration wasn't as sort of, Exciting, I guess, right? Um, I mean, we'd only be looking at about maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, but yeah, the cap was never reached at any point because there were all these sort of exclusions and stuff. So it was never as, I mean, when I talked to, you know, our, 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 my, my US counterpart, of course, um, you know, H1B season, of course, as you say, right? It's a very exciting time. Everybody's pretty stressed out there, right? Um, but during our time, we, you know, when we had a cap, we weren't, you know, we were exciting at probably one point when it was announced. And then the cap was never reached, so they scrapped it altogether. Uh, so our system is more based on, you know, the skill level, of the job, um, you know, salary paid effectively, um, certain requirements like English language requirement to a certain extent, you know, um, you know what, what the job looks like, that type of stuff that we look at in the combination. So it's, it's a point-based system. Um, is it, 
actually point-based system, that, that's up for argument, of course, but you have to meet certain points, and those points are either you meet it or you don't. So that's where I say it's up for argument in terms of whether it's a real point-based system, but certainly, yeah, those those elements add together to the right points um, yeah. for us to get it. Yeah. But I think, I, I suppose there yeah. is one sort of lottery system, which is the, um, and I was telling my team earlier today, it's it's, it's the, uh, it's the um, uh, effectively the youth mobility scheme before Indian uh, professionals or young professionals, mm-hmm. effectively, and that's three thousand. That's capped at three thousand, uh, and, and gotcha, season's kind gotcha. of open. So, yeah. So that makes the UK. What is it like? A handful of countries operate some, on a points based system, right? The UK, Canada, and I, I think Australia. Australia might definitely. Be a few yeah. Others. yeah. 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 Oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, well, it's kind of kind of funny you mentioned that, like you know, looking back, it, it has changed obviously, and I think a big part of that change, as I'm sure you're well aware, is uh, Brexit. Mm. Uh, we can't talk UK immigration without at least mentioning Brexit, yeah, um, the kind of like the before Brexit and then post mm. Brexit. Uh, um, and so, yeah, I guess, Antonio, how do you compare and contrast um, the the inner workings of the immigration system that in that pre Brexit model com- compared to was it, I think it went into effect uh, 2020? Uh, end of 2020. Yeah. End of 20. Yeah. I mean, there's a pathway, obviously, for European citizens uh, who were uh, went to the UK before this time to apply for what we call the European Union Settlement Scheme, so USS for sure, uh, and family members to that effect. Um, I think I think it's more a combination of, I mean, everybody feared Brexit, um, not saying whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, that's not that's not the what, what um, is important in this sort of, I guess, instance. It's, I guess, it's a combination almost of, of Brexit and almost COVID in that sense, which sort of drove up the uh, immigration numbers, so to speak, right? And there has been changes since. So, for example, during that sort of large amount of time, because obviously Brexit negotiations and Brexit and thereafter has been such a long period of time, right? Um, you know, we went from um, having you know, just a certain skill level of job, which used to be graduate level skilled jobs, to now effectively high school graduate level or experience level jobs. So. Um, level six versus level three, that type of stuff. So you've got the sort of difference. So I guess that sort of hyped up the the, the, the interest of it, right? Um, so I think there there are there are statistics that that are out there in terms of you know the numbers of increases and stuff, and they are not as a result really of because of European nationals. Certainly, we deal with a lot more European nationals in terms of uh, needing work permits post Brexit because of course everybody's now treated as uh, a third country national. So like anybody else, we need a visa. Um, but is that the sort of key driver uh, for that? Um, some would argue, of course, yes, by, you know, by proxy, it definitely would be, right? Um, but, you know, from from what we look at, certainly on a day-to-day basis, it's, I think there are many drivers, and I think that Brexit is only one of the, 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 the uh, one of many drivers that, that, that that's driving up the numbers. I really quickly, what are uh, what are some of those other drivers uh, that you think are driving up numbers? I mean, healthcare it was definitely one of them, right? Um, and and mm-hmm. and that's uh, certainly that's one of the changes that's gonna sort of occur, right? Um, so during COVID, we realized obviously, hey, you know, healthcare system really we need a lot more people, and so um, a lot of those numbers have been driven. We've introduced, I, I think, when I say we as in as in the UK has introduced the health and care workers, uh, not just a sort of standard one, so it's it's almost a quicker. Um, some may say easier pathway, but certainly a slightly different pathway into uh, the UK um, because there is a need in the driver, right? Um, there are a number of, of, of nationals, obviously, uh, different nationals that are coming into the, the UK that open up a lot, you know, uh, the economy open up a lot, of course. And so the work is not no longer outsourced, it's coming back into the UK. And so these foreign nationals obviously will be needed as well. Uh, so there was a boom, obviously, of, of um, I remember those days where everybody's opening offices elsewhere other than the UK, right, for example, uh, at one point in time. <clears throat> and so the need was really overseas. So I was, for example, dealing with more outbound UK rather than inbound UK. But now we're seeing over the last few years more inbound UK because a lot of you know businesses are now focusing again UK as a key driver, you know, what pieces of advice or recommendation? And I know, I know, we can't 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 give, can't give too much advice, uh, but I guess just what general uh, tip, best practices do you have for employers who maybe are looking to expand or open an office in, in the UK, whether this year, next year, or even in the near future? Well, it, it, it's 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 exciting because of the of of the. I mean, there is certainly a number of changes. One of the key things to look at, uh, and I've been uh, telling all. Uh, 
everyone actually that I, that I speak about immigration is, hey, by the way, th there's going to be some salary changes, right? And we'll talk a bit about that, I'm sure. Um, uh, just to look at your workforce, right? What do you need and what the salary levels are? And I think those 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 are those are good to map out because at the moment a lot of uh, a lot of the headline sort of salary levels are pretty low. I would probably say, right? I mean, it's twenty six thousand two hundred at the moment, right? It's going to increase um, a lot by 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 April. Um, so you know, a lot of employers will need to sort of look at their workforce again and basically say, hey, how do I sort of plan that, right? And I think that that's quite important. I also think there's um, there's a huge emphasis on compliance that um, and processes that people haven't really been. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are looking at, but certainly that's probably not the priority, right? And I feel. 2024 onwards is all about processes and, and, and compliance. So that's something sort of um, warning, I'll probably say, to, to employers to, to look at. Um, and I think that's quite a quite an important thing. Yeah, you mentioned some changes. So I think that's a perfect segue to, to kind of the, the heart of, the, of our conversation today. Uh, so Antonio, we are recording this in, on the middle of February mm. of 2024, and will be released in early March, um, partly because there are a, a quite a quite a few impactful changes that uh, we want to discuss today. The first one being um, some sponsor license changes. Mm. So first things first, Antonio, uh, can you give us an overview of the UK sponsor license? Yeah, of course. So um, so effectively, I mean, um, we'll, we'll look at a summary. We won't go into too much detail about that. Otherwise, everybody's going to go to sleep, right? Uh, is that many? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> You know, some people might, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe a future episode, we could do a, a deep dive into, into the sponsor license. Well, that, that, that's, I think that would be a very good idea. Or otherwise, you know, that, that would be a, a whole different uh, program that we can do it, right? Before, before bed, listen to Antonio Lam, right? Um, that, that would be, that would be one way to go about it. Um, but, but yeah, so effectively a sponsor license is for anyone who, um, uh, who, 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 who necessarily need, or who is likely to need somebody from overseas to join them or somebody who who require visas to be sponsored uh, by them to work in the UK. So there are two main routes, uh, I would probably say, right, uh, with different sort of categories of it, right? I would probably call one a permanent one and one a, a, a transfer uh, or assignment-based uh, route, right? So one is the skilled worker route that I talked about, uh, which effectively are for, I would say, either permanent transfers, effectively, or those new hires in the, uh, in the UK. Uh, so you would want to look at that sort of skilled worker route. Um, and then for more temporary transfers, I say five years or nine years, or sometimes depending on uh, the, the different routes. So you've got, you know, expansion worker, you've got, you know, um, international agreement, that type of stuff. Um, so it's very different sort of high value sort of um, contracts. You have a, have, a, have a different license on that. There are about, I think, five routes on that. And that will be the global business mobility route, which is really focusing on uh, temporary movements of, of staff from overseas uh, to the UK uh, or you know, for contractual sort of partners into the UK on, you know, 12-month basis, uh, that type of stuff. So those are the sort of two things every employer would want to look at when they want to apply for uh, uh, for a license, uh, effectively. Um, most of um, uh, most of our clients use both, I would say. It depends on really the need, right? Because a lot of times we will encounter um, companies which basically say, hey, by the way, there, there's, a, there's a real need uh, for this person to be in the UK on a project basis for, for your Right, um, and so we would use we would lean towards depending on the job, depending on, on the salary and everything else. We tend tend to lean towards more the global business mobility side, but then we have the, the other side, which is hey, you know, we've seen this amazing talent that we're gonna we're gonna recruit from within the UK from overseas, um, and we want them now forever, right? And so the skilled worker would be something that we would advise that they look at. So the, these changes are, there are some changes mm -hmm. coming on yeah. April 6th or 6th of April. Uh, can you break down these changes and yeah. the impacts of these changes? No, absolutely. I mean, the changes actually sort of occurred or started to uh, move along, right? So on the 25th of uh, January, um, any, any, any uh, uh, license holders uh, who, who, who's um, licensed, uh, so it used to be the case that the license is granted for a period of four years. Right, and you have to renew every four years. Uh, and on 25th of January, um, anybody who has a license expired, which is beyond 6th of April, would be given a sort of interim, sort of 10 year licensing period automatically across the board. So if anyone holds a license, check it out. It sh you should have a 10 year license of whatever expiry that you have. Um, and yeah, from 6th of April, effectively, um, there's no more need to renew the license. 
uh, which is quite amazing to most employees, right? Because every time you renew, it's 536 pounds for a small company or 1,476 um, pounds, at, at least the cost now, government fee, um, to, to do that, right? Um, but that's where I sort of heed caution, right? Uh, and that's, I guess that's what the impact is. The impact is great, right? I mean, hey, I don't need to ever renew it again so I can sleep at night. Yes, you can sleep at night, but not side of things, right? But I guess there is the sort of continual heightened duty, right? I would probably suggest uh, on compliance to making sure that everything is right, right? Because um, I was about to use the terminology that I usually use, but probably it's copyrighted, so I won't say it now. But, you know, when you have a lot of, power, then you sort of have certain things that you need to follow, right? So, and compliance is definitely one of those, right? Um, is is that uh, from, from Spider-Man? Yeah, exactly. So I, I'm not sure how you know, Marvel will, 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 will feel that if I start using it, you know, freely, you know, uh, so that, it's, yeah. that's my favorite line. The Uncle Ben saying. Yeah, 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 Uncle yeah, Ben no, saying, okay. right? Yeah. Yeah, we got to <laughs> use that. And I, and, I, and I honestly believe that's true. I mean, that to be honest, that's how I sort of ran my immigration program for the last 20 years, you know? Uh, but it is true. They, they, there's a lot of trust between home office and uh, employer. You are always expected to be compliant. Um, and, you know, but let's be honest, right? You know, compliance is not, you know, whilst I know like 100% of our clients are very, you know, clue double compliance and they really, really want to do it. But it is also a lot of extra work, right? But now with, you know, uh, license being, you know, a, a, a indefinite sort of grant, I would suspect if I was the, the authorities to say, hey, hang on, hey, you know, is there the, the 1% or the 0.5% of license holder who may not well be very compliant, right? Uh, and they basically using that because, you know, maybe they think that we're no longer going to check, right? And they may heighten that activity. And I really feel that that would be uh, heightened. And I would encourage everyone to really start looking at their program, start looking at the license and, uh, and, and compliance. And I think that's the biggest impact I would, I would, probably, uh, I would probably say. Yeah. This change uh, uh, came from uh, the Home Office. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. So it was it was published on. So anybody who 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 has access to the uh, sponsor management system, which uh, of course, if you don't have access to it as a as a license holder, I encourage um, you to have it. You do need it. You should have it. You should log in. Uh, but yeah. So it's 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 it's, it's published uh, on the on the literally license front front page. Uh, and when this when this change was orig originally announced uh, by the Home Office, what was their justification or reasoning for for introducing this change? To be honest with you, I'm still grappling with what is the justification for that, right? But <laughs> I, I guess in a way, you know, my guess is it, it's um, I'm sure there's some justification that I haven't sort of seen or read. But my 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 line of thinking is is it's is very simple. It's, it's it's actually quite nonsensical, right? In, in, in that mm -hmm. sense, right? Because Every employer has a continuing duty, as I say, on, on compliance. Right? They need to they need mm -hmm. to fulfil certain rules in order to 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 employ uh, an individual, like applying for a certificate of sponsorship or issuing or signing a certificate, of sponsorship, whichever may be the case. Right? Um, so the, the rules are there in place. Right? So is there an actual need to continue to do to do that? Right? Um, so so I think it's good news in in that sense for employers definitely that they no longer need to sort of have that sort of extra bit that they need to schedule on the tracker. Yeah, yeah, because it, it feels like that that, that, that maybe historically, I, I have no facts to back this up, but but the, to the point of having to track it, it could be one of those things that just falls through the cracks. And then maybe an employer just doesn't know until until, mm -hmm. you know, it comes up. Um, so, Antonio, the next, um, I guess, big change that we wanted to discuss, we're going to dub the announcements. Uh, so the UK immigration minister recently announced uh, many changes mm. uh, to the country's immigration rules. And a big discussion has been the uh, UK's electronic travel authorization system, otherwise known as the ETA. Yeah. Uh, so I guess, can you discuss uh, this, why why this is being discussed uh, more and more and kind of what, what some of these uh, changes from the UK immigration minister are? Yeah, so I mean, the ETIS wasn't part was sort of part of the, the sort of um, ad hoc announcement, I guess, in that sense, right? It's been announced for a long time. Um, it's already sort of in practice, but now put into as the ETIS, right? The FTS. Um, it's for five Middle Eastern countries at the moment. Uh, I'm sure it will be it will be continued to be expanded. That's the intent of it. But UK generally is going through a digital age. Uh, or another wave of digital sort of uh, system, right? So, for example, a lot of um, uh, a lot or most. Uh, people who hold a BRP card at the moment, which has a, a visa expiry beyond 31st of December, would see 
A, why is my BRP on the 31st of December, right, uh, 2024 this year? And do I need to do anything in order that? But that that's part of the drive um, uh, by the by the Home Office for many years now to make everything digital. And I think that's the right thing to do. Um, I, I just I, I just think passports. I think BRP cards. I think physical documents are quite out of fashion for many reasons. They're not environmentally friendly, but also it's out of fashion, right? You've got biometrics. You've got everything. Um, so I think Home Office see exactly the same thing. They're transforming the entire system into e-visas. So a lot of people already have that e-visa, sort of European nationals. Um, that's the sort of pioneering point. U USS, everyone has an e-visa at that point. A lot of people who are already based in the UK who has, already has, um, uh, has an e-visa. When they switch visas uh, from within the UK, apply for visas if they held the BRP card. Uh, so those are those are moving along. I think the, the electronic travel uh, is just part to part of sort of that process um, and, and that was sort of parallel to, to, to this digitalization anyway, uh, is to make well travel easier, right? Um, there's no need for vignette printing and all of that running out of paper and stickers and whatnot that needs to be done, right? And the process is much swifter. I mean, it doesn't, obviously, yeah. it doesn't negate the need to apply for visas because um, obviously if the, if the electronic travel uh, declaration doesn't work, then you still need to apply for the visa. But it just makes life a lot easier, a lot more borderless feel. So how how have uh, the move towards introducing more digi digitization, I always have trouble saying that word, uh, how how so far has that impacted UK travel requirements? Um, I think, well, definitely at one point, uh, I would say when, when it was first introduced in e-visas, I think port offices were very confused uh, at the time. Right. And we have seen, you know, time and time again, I've got my clients calling me on my mobile basis saying, oh, I've got an e-visa, but they, 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 they said, we, we, you know, that, that's not the right thing. It was a very short sort of lift moment of chaos, but everybody knows about it now, which is which is great. So that that shows that it is working, right? E-visas work, which is brilliant, right? Um, but it also it also helps um, a lot because at the moment there's, you have to fill out forms or, or basically you don't really need to update your personal detail, or you're supposed to update details, but people forget, right? Uh, but when you have an EV, so you know that you will need to update your details on your UKVI account, for example, your UK visa immigration account. So you, d you definitely sort of do that. You know, has it impact make it, made it easier? I think it has made it easier, uh, certainly, because um, for application process uh, is, is one thing, right? Let, let's uh, not talk about just the ETIS, right? Let's talk about normal work visa that you have. Um, so for someone who is in the UK, for example, who, let's just say, um, and we've recently done one for a client um, um, uh, who, who actually had medical needs and, and requires that sort of e-ness, let's just say, right? But for many normal, um, for every, everyday sort of visa applications, you now no longer need to sort of book an appointment to submit your biometrics, right? Uh, because every visa application requires a, well, in the UK anyway, you require a biometric uh, appointment uh, so that you can you know, enroll your biometric details. But now you can do that on your mobile phone uh, through, through, through a government app, right? Um, for a lot of the circumstances, of course, it doesn't flow through everyone, but certainly for, in, in most circumstances now, um, which means you shave off a lot of that time, right? Of booking lead time for appointments, for example, and also attendance. Right, so you can be in your comfort of your office and just sort of go. All right, I need to sort out my visa, and I can enroll my biometrics. Right, and then I can now complete my application form. I can now submit everything online. I mean, talk about good old days. What, fifteen years ago, whatever it is, you know, everything you need to print, you know, write down, you know, type. Let's just say, and then attend the appointment, and then submit everything and send everything. It's it's a whole different world. Um, so we, yeah. we would think it, it's quicker uh, in many respects, obviously. Um, uh, I feel, uh, and you have a yeah. much quicker way of checking because obviously it's not just about the traveler or the passenger itself or the visa applicant itself, but also about the employer because the next thing is, hey, let's do right to work checks, right? Mm. Um, so, you know, now it's share code and if you have an e, you know, e account, I mean, of course, the share code online thing is a slightly different uh, element, but they're also digitalizing this and they have been doing so for some years now. So it's now online right to work checks instead of your physical check, make sure you have those copies and all that stuff. Uh, so it's a huge sort of uh, difference in terms of the way we approach um, things. So digitalization, I think, all the way, I think that's the right thing. How much time do you think all of this digitization um, shaves off if an employer is looking to you know, bring someone into the UK, inbound UK? Um, I think in real terms, I think you're looking at, I mean, UK is pretty quick anyway, right? Unlike country, other mm -hmm. countries, you're looking at like six months or whatever may be the case, right? Mm -hmm. um, UK tends to be very quick. Uh, so processing timeline, I, I mean, 
always differs and seasonal and you know depending on you know what globally is happening and these application centers right um but the processing timeline can be shaved off five weeks right because i mean just appointment times for example let's look at in-country uk applications right we tend to be look at unless you you know sort of pay for an appointment uh, and even then there could be like sort of seven days or so sort of lead time you know usually you're looking two or three weeks right if you need to attend a biometrics appointment um if your application or your application requires to do so right here you can do it online right so th there you go there's your three weeks right there right the consideration time tends to be around the same so they don't they don't differ because once the biometric go in they are quite efficient i think uk is one of the more efficient um dare i say it um, they're quite efficient in, in, in many ways, right? Uh, but this definitely um, helped. But it's, it's just the pre-work time. Uh, um, so assigning feel less, uh, employees feel less stressed because they are comfortable where they are. They don't need to, you know, travel in a busy work day. They can literally spend, for example, 10 minutes with one of our guys just to sort it out or themselves, right? And, you know, after, after work, they can just sort it out. So that helps a lot. Uh, but I think weeks we would be looking at. It's always it's always uh, funny when when we're talking out loud and then we realize there are actually are some things that either are like local or federal governments are efficient and it's like oh wait yeah they actually are pretty good at that. Yeah, credit where the credit's due, right? But I mean, I, yeah. I guess I always moan about you know processes, but you know I, I think every 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 system has improvements uh, that they can they can yeah. put in, right? But hey, here we are. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, so Antonio, some other changes I uh, wanted to discuss, and you hinted at one earlier, but just some additional uh, you know, discussion. Uh, these are likely to be come into effect in the near future, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and you're, we're, we're expecting these changes to reduce the number of skilled foreign nationals entering the UK. Uh, so starting March 11th, a ban on newly arrived care workers um, from bringing immediate family members to the UK under dependent visas. And then at the start of April, on the 4th of April, uh, the skilled worker minimum salary increases that you hinted at, uh, those will take effect. And then um, you also mentioned in, in our pre, pre-show pre discussion that you know somewhere likely around the 4th of April as well, that the, there will be some initial changes to the shortage occupation list on uh, note that the, that will take effect. Uh, let's start with the first one on the March 11th, the ban on newly arrived care workers. Um, can you provide an overview of this change and um, what impacts that you may be that we might see? Yeah, I, I mean, so I think it's, again, part and parcel of um, because they were I mean, the, the reason, I guess, why these plethora changes were, were, were sort of announced, so to speak, um, um, or even looked at. Uh, throughout even before the announcements uh, by the immigration minister is because of the statistics that came out, right? We, we, we have a sort of almost double the amount of people um, that, are, that are effectively coming in. A lot of it obviously is driven by health and care um, health workers, right? Um, and so one of the drivers that they feel could uh, help with easing those numbers, and now again, not commenting whether it will work, not work, or whether policy makes sense is, you know, they think family members are one of the, the hard hitting points, right? Um, and so healthcare workers, uh, health and care workers, without going into too much detail of it, have a sort of special, as I say, sort of special rule of coming in. There's certain things that they don't need to be otherwise, right? And they're able to bring in family members who otherwise could also work and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so rather than, I wouldn't use the word ban, but, but certainly they now, you know, not allowing, um, you know, new applicants to, to then uh, uh, have family members to join them, uh, which obviously would have an impact because um, the, the immediate, uh, you know, simply, think about is it's why do I want to come to the UK right and, and go into a system where I'm not able to bring my family members right because if I have a family um, or child children right you don't want to be well thousands of miles apart right if I'm coming over right, right. I, I think I think right. that's 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 that that's uh, I think that's one of the, the biggest impact that I would see especially when we have been so reliant on I mean, again, there's two way, two prong sort of argument to that. We've been very reliant on overseas uh, health workers to assist our, 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 our with our system, um, and now we sort of are basically saying, oh, "Sorry, yeah, yeah." Does does uh, as part of the UK immigration system, if someone comes over on a dependent visa, are there mechanisms 
uh, the government where they can where they allow dependents to work? Yeah. So unlike some countries, I mean, uh, I think I think uh, there are many countries that won't allow dependents to work, for example. But UK again, I think UK has a very generous and fair system, uh, and and dependents, mm-hmm. you know, rather than you know, expecting dependents to sit at home and do nothing. Um, mm. But they, they are allowed to work. They are allowed to be self-employed. You know, they're allowed to study. They're allowed to, you know, reside generally, right? Uh, yeah. And I think that's the right thing, you know. Uh, yeah. Again, I think that's why they want to limit that as well, because then, you know, um, there's the argument of, are we too reliant on uh, overseas workforce? Are we, mm. you know, are, are, we, are we promoting local workforce enough? And again, the argument would be, well, are we training them enough or is there sufficient numbers? But certainly yeah. that's one of the ways that they feel could tackle uh the the numbers um mm-hmm. but i think i think the more the one of the bigger impacts and you've mentioned that was the the second uh the change which is the salary changes um i, I feel yeah yeah well yeah so this one will, will come into effect on the 4th of april and so you you hint, you hinted at it earlier but uh yeah can you walk us through this this change yeah so the so 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 this this particularly hit skilled worker under the skilled worker route so at the moment it's it's 26200 um so 26000 pounds of 200 uh 26200 pounds uh, per annum basically sorry um uh, per year, that's a basic sort of minimum salary that one needs to meet uh, for under the skilled worker route, or of, of course the uh, skilled occupation code, or um, uh, that 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 needs to be met as well, whichever is sort of higher. So it's rarely, it's not always the case. Let's just say that people look at that sort of highlighter number twenty six two hundred. That that's the number that needs to be because actually there's a second tier to look at that. But nonetheless, that is going to um, uh, change, and that's going to increase. Uh, to 38,700 um, per annum. So that's a huge increase, right, in, in terms of the, uh, the salary of it. Um, and certainly would have an impact. I think for London-based workers and for most professional sectors that we work with, um, the impact may not be as high as we would, or as severe, let's just say, as we would as we would see, because of course, you know, highly skilled workers, you know, you have your software engineers, for example, you will have, you know, project managers, you will have your consultants, you know, all of those that are likely to be beyond that uh, amount of, of basic minimum salary, right? Um, of course, but then you have a whole bunch of others, which will be impacted, right? I mean, imagine not every single city would have the same salary range, right? And that's one of my fears as well, as well. People already sort of, when, when most people would think of working, they don't think of other cities, right? London is probably, you know, I may be generalizing here, but certainly probably one of the first places I would think about, right? Um, but what about people that are up sort of north, for example, right? Uh, which otherwise are the Midlands um, in, in, in the UK, where the salary levels may not be normally as high as London, for example. Right, you know, are they going to be impacted? And my my gut would tell me, yeah, probably um, they will be. I mean, there are also sector based that are not, you know, the, the basic salary just isn't that high. And I guess the the whole point is, you know, if we look at the obviously worker sort of side of things and also employer side of things, they'll be looking at, well, hang on there, there is there is an issue, right? Even though it might not impact me right now, let's just say I have workers which are below that rate that are working for me. They're skilled, they're needed, they're valued. Um, yeah, so I guess on that point, I guess, you know, how do you recommend employers, you know, I guess, start to prepare and, and kind of what next steps that, that maybe they should take? Yeah, I mean, we're working with a number of clients ourselves uh, and we started to look at salary bandwidth, um, or salary banding and bandwidth rather, uh, both of which we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at, you know, the, the mobility program altogether, right? Um, so, you know, local hires, what, what, what roles that they are actually looking at, whether, whether or not they're ready you know, uh, the, the roles itself, what, what, what likely uh, salaries are we sort of looking at? Are they looking at shortage? We'll talk about shortage in a bit because that will, that will come into effect too. You know, are they, are they you know, um, what type of uh, uh, positions that they they, 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 they they need? You know, are they graduates? Because that's not really touched upon by the by the announcements. So obviously, the rules are not published or the new rules, exact rules haven't been published yet. I don't think they will touch it, but, you know, the graduate sort of thing can be looked at um, uh, as well. Um, you know, we are looking at, you know, how they sponsor people because a lot of employers at the moment, uh, for example, will continue to renew um, some of the workers' uh, visas without even thinking, you know, um, despite the fact that maybe we need to look at more other personal routes, for example. That's one way of looking at it. Uh, so for superbly highly skilled and in, in very specific sectors, we're looking at 
um, perhaps uh, looking at other routes, looking at indefinite leave to remain, so settlement, permanent residence, that type of stuff. Um, but mainly we're working with employers around salary bandings. We're looking at the uh, type of jobs that they truly need effectively, let's just say. Um, and we're putting sort of a list together um, to work on, you know, how best to fit into the, the future program. Gotcha. So Antonio, the next uh, big change that I wanted to ask, and we've been we've been somewhat hinting at it, but it, it is the update to the shortage occupation list. Um otherwise known as the SOL. Yeah. Uh, and this change will likely also take effect in early April. Uh, what prompted these changes and yeah. what should employers expect? Well, yeah. So again, I think it is part of the, it's part of the, I guess the program, right, of, 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 of limiting, one will say limiting migration, but I guess adjusting uh, would, would, would also be a word that one can use, right? Um, adjusting the numbers on, on, on those immigration uh, or the interest, right? A lot of the, um, at the moment, and, and I sort of, I tend to agree with this shortage occupation because the shortage occupation at the moment um, it is compiled by, um, obviously the Home Office, but, but, but generally compiled and advised by the Migration Advisory Committee, so the MAC. Uh, effectively, and they've been asked, and, and time and time again, they, they they have looked at it and go, "Hey, hang on, is shortage really a shortage? Right? Are you really are those really shortages? And how are you using that shortage occupation?" And at the moment, a lot of um, and, and that's certainly the view uh, is that um, not personal view, but certainly the view is that this list is only used as a salary discount, right? Because um, at the moment, shortage occupation sort of uh, for, for 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 any job that's on the shortage occupation list, they enjoy um an 80 uh, sort of 80 percent of the going rate of the role right which means then you don't need to meet that sort of higher or minimum salary threshold so to speak if it doesn't and then it goes into that sort of 80 percentile um which is great right because that attracts that shortage and so we can we you know employees can then you know utilize that they, they're not a stress so to speak right but the whole point i guess is is it really shortage and we're just using it as a discount right and so that's i think that's one of the concerns and that's why they're gonna they want to scrap it and that's what the, the whole point is right so the mac is now already consulting and i think today if i'm i hope i'm right i think today is a day when they they kind of submit the 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 the, the, the the recommendations as well on that on the new shortage occupation list effectively the shortage occupation list as we know it will not exist um, w- um with new rules um there will be a new immigration salary list i think that's what's called now um that will that will basically reflect hopefully what the shortage occupations are effectively so mm. that so-called discount uh salary rate will no longer exist effectively which i guess that's that's part part and parcel of the change in, and and that that, that that will be what it is. I mean, everyone asks me, what do you think will go, right? I don't know. I mm-hmm. wish I had that magic ball. Um, like in terms of like jobs being yeah, like, so the, yeah, list? Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, we know that it's going to be very limiting in terms of the roles that are going to be re- going to be on there. Um, the Mac certainly will, will be publishing that anyway. So so I, 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 I wait with sort of um, much interest into what, what they're going to be doing. I know the new stuff is going to come in in March, so I'm sure we'll sit down again and have a chat, chat about it. Um, but it will certainly be interesting to, to see how, how that works. But the short excavation will, will go. And and, and um, again, how, how would that impact? Well, again, back down to salary, right? So are you paying your workers at that sort of rate level? Are you relying purely on that? They're not saying, obviously, that, hey, by the way, if it's not on shortage, then you cannot, you cannot hire these people, right? Back in... Back in the very good old days, shortage occupation generally is a um, lower skill, but shortage. Um, so, for example, chefs were one of those, you know, um, and then IT roles, I think, were on there and all, all that type of stuff, right? But they, at the time when it was graduate level, the shortage occupation list in a way worked quite well because some of the roles there are, might not have hit that sort of high th- graduate threshold. Then it sort of evolved and it's sort of, is there still a need for it, right? Is it just used as a salary thing? Um, and now, I guess, and let, obviously, we talked about the impact on the salary, but if the salary is not impacted, it doesn't stop, obviously, an employer from continuing to employ. Um, it's basically when you have a shortage, you cannot meet the salary. Um, if you do not rely on the old sort of discount, that's when where the I think it will really, really, really come to hit. So you mentioned that we're expecting a, a new list um, in the near future. Where do you recommend uh, listeners, employers go to kind of just stay up to date? And, and where, where, where would they find this new list? Listen to our podcast, right? I mean, that's, that's what it's about. No, we, we actually publish quite a lot of news, as you know, right? And uh, so yes. as soon as, as 
as it's published, we, we, we basically talk about it straight away, but the home office is very good. So the, um, the home office website, um, and, and also the, uh, the Mac website, uh, which is obviously part of the, 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 the gov.uk site, um, they, they do, they do publish all of that. Uh, the, the, the new set of immigration rules, uh, will, will come into effect with, um, well, come to publication, let's just say, and, and lay before parliament, um, in mid, uh, March, of course. So that will be also, of course, be, be published as a statement of change, and that's published on the Home Office. So we are very, I mean, UK system is very transparent. It, it all, it, it all gets published uh, publicly uh, for us to review that. But hey, and, you know, we will, we will, we will, we will talk about it. Yes, yeah, so we'll stay tuned for for all the uh, all that upcoming information. Uh, well, Antonio, as we kind of near the end, just kind of wanted to, you know, zoom out a little bit and just talk to you about uh, the UK as a work and living destination. Um, before we get there, where you're in London or are you somewhere else? I'm in London. Country? Yeah. You're in London. Gotcha. Nice. I love London. Um, as you mentioned, kind of at the top, you know, even with all these changes, the UK is still a popular destination for employers and individuals to move to. It is truly one of those global cities that everyone knows a lot of businesses have offices there or you know headquarters um etc etc uh i i guess question is you know what trends do you see playing out these next few months and even years when it comes to the uk and its approach to immigration and um all that good stuff i think to be honest i mean as with i mean i've seen a lot of uh changes over the the US, big, small, you know, political changes, financial, macroeconomy, economic changes, you know, and, you know, we've seen quite a lot of those, right? You know, back in crisis, back in the day, you know, um, have we seen a downturn? The answer is, well, no, we have seen, definitely, we have seen peaks and troughs and dips, right? We've seen all of that uh, over, 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 over the many years. And I, and I don't think these particular changes is going to prevent people from coming to the UK. I think it will make it a bit more complex in terms of planning. Um, I mean, salary levels are at all time high in many countries anyway. So, you know, so we're not the country that will stand out to say, oh my God, it's, it's the toughest. I think the UK continues to be attractive for many reasons and immigration, the ease of, uh, to be honest with you, applying f despite, you know, the general sort of headlines, let's just say, right. The ease of application, the speed of application, the accessibility, um, of, 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 of workforce and, and, and visa options. Well, that hasn't changed. It's still there, right? Um, the only complexity, of course, is, you know, salary ranges and all of that type of stuff. That will continue to evolve and change as we go along, right? So we might see a small little temporary dip because people need to readjust and basically say, hey, is that the right thing still to do? But for majority of companies, um, certainly ones that we've uh, encountered so far, again, not mentioning or not discounting what I talked about in terms of the regional firms, but certainly the big headquarters and things, they would be looking at, as with them looking at the entire uh, global mobility program, is, well, is it UK, is UK still the place that we want to be? Well, and, and, and then we look at other factors, right? Is UK economy still good, ease of business, right? How easy is it to set up in the UK? I mean, UK, we can boast, is still probably one of the many places um, that you know, setting up businesses and, and, and operating headquarters is still amazing uh, in terms of that. The incentives uh, in, in the UK are, are, are I, can, I can go on all day about it. I mean, I, I, think, I think that's the, the main pull factor of it. So immigration, I think, will, 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 will be one of those um, a consideration, but by comparison to many other countries, um, US for one, for example, right, um, or, or some Asian countries, UK is still pretty accessible, and um, and I think the program is still fairly transparent and clear. Um, and I think it's about certainty as well. I think that's one of the things because it's not a case of you need to wait for yours for your visa, and we have no clue whether that's going to be the case or why don't you come in first and then do this and that. Right? We basically say get your mm -hmm. visa first, and we can tell you pretty quickly what's going to happen next. So, yeah. And I think in the next few years, we're going to probably ex experience the same. Um, you know, as long as we are politically financially stable which I, there's no reason why we don't think that will be the case. I think UK will continue to be a very attractive place. I'll tread lightly with, with the question, um, but you mentioned political stability and yep. how much of the immigration system in the UK is influenced by the, the majority party in parliament and the prime minister, yeah. Yeah, obviously comparing to, to the US, yep. there are some certain, some, you know, 
the, the, the president can can influence immigration policy mm-hmm. quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Canada, you know, the trends, even you know, whether it's labor or conservative, the Canadian immigration has steadily been going up for, for I think, like decades now. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, UK as businesses, maybe if whether they're there or they're thinking about opening an office, how mm-hmm. much of the political landscape influences immigration? I, I think it always will, right? Politics come hand in hand almost, right? I mean, again, we won't go too deep in, into, into that side of things, right? Because it's way too complex, but certainly it will. I mean, we've got two main sort of, I guess, uh, political parties that will find power uh, anyway, and they do have slightly different stance in terms of immigration, right? We won't say which one is easy or not, but certainly there was a point where, I guess, uh, the previous prime minister uh, has changed certain um, uh, goalposts, let's just say, and then people are saying that's a contributing factor to you know, uh, to the rise in immigration and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and now, for example, there's a lot of focus on illegal migration or preventing illegal migration, you know, the so-called sort of small boats and all of that type of stuff. Again, um, there will be always be different focus on that. Um, I think all parties at the moment, I feel, again, I, I know people would disagree with me, um to a certain degree is you know all party field yeah the numbers might be affected that they don't really want to talk about that much so they probably told very similar lines at the moment um but i think most certainly with political winds changing um again financial stability is much more important right because will your party be strong enough to hold that sort of you know the finances right uh, and i think that will be the the true driver of how how UK is going to be. Well said, well said. Well, Antonio, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, morning for me, late afternoon for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and just as we look to wrap things up, uh, anything that we missed that you want to quickly touch on? I'm sure we have missed a lot of things that we can talk about. <laughs> but I think for the changes, I mean, there's still, I mean, we know quite a lot of details already. Um, um, that we've talked about, there will be a lot more that will be the detail, though, devil in the detail, right? So a lot of those things, like the new um, uh, immigration salary list, um, a lot of the effective dates, obviously, they, they will all be they will all be published. So I look forward, I guess, in that sense, to talking a bit more about the direct changes when when, when they come uh, to publish. Uh, we can only talk about headlines at the moment, which um, which we need to know a bit more. Uh, final question for you, Antonio. Uh, you mentioned you've been in London for 20 something years. Uh, have you taken up a uh, Premier League? Oh, no, uh, football's never, I, I should never admit to this, right? But no, so I've been, uh, yeah, I've been in the UK for 20 plus years, but no, football has never been, unfortunately, my biggest thing. Uh, it's more Formula One and snooker. That's more my thing. So, yeah. Nice. All right. I <laughs> uh, love it. Love it. Love it. Awesome. Well, Antonio, uh, thank you so much for uh, chatting today. Um, I guess I actually a final, final question uh, for those who are listening and maybe uh, want to follow some of your insights. Um, where where can they do so? And uh, are you or can they, you know, are you going to be at any events coming up in the UK um, and all that good stuff? Well, yeah, there, there are quite a quite a few events that are, uh, that are planned. Um, uh, we still drawing those on the calendar, but listeners will be sure to hear from me in terms of that. And we always publish our events. So check that out. Well, Antonio, uh, thank you so much for, for hopping on today and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you for having me.